moves a thin ghost of music in the spinet. I cannot say your speed, I cannot wander your hill lands, or your cornlands, or your valleys ever again, nor share the battle yonder where the young knights of broken squadron rally. Only sit quiet while my mind remembers the beauty of fire from the beauty of embers. Welcome back to another episode of Exit Unsolved with me, Detective Ken Maines. Now, got a very interesting case today because it's not a clear-cut case of homicide. It is what I call, other people I guess too, call an equivocal death, meaning don't know. Could be suicide, could be natural, uh, accidental, homicide. So what we have to do is deduce till we figure out which one it is. So this is the case of Robin Pope. You just listened to the 911 call from her husband, even though they were separated, Wayne. And again, I don't like putting people's uh, names out there and talk about them, uh, you know, their last names and stuff, but this is already out there. There's been some shows that have been done already on the case, so I don't necessarily feel too bad about doing it. Um, but the basis of this case was that R Robin Pope was a 51 year old white female who went missing on March 1st, 2013 from Stevensville, Maryland at a place called Kent Island, as you can see from the map here. So what we have to figure out, along with it being, you know, what type of death it is, um, we have to look at her victimology. What type of person is she? Uh, and that's imperative in all cases, right? But in here, it's particularly important because it's, it's a case where we're not just looking at who murdered her, if she was murdered. We are looking at, okay, could it be any of these other reasons? And... Through her victimology, this is what I have come to find out. Uh, she was married for 22 years to Wayne, the individual that you heard make the 911 call. However, they had been separated um, since December, meaning she had an affair with her gym instructor. Um, but they still lived together apparently until February 1st when she actually moved out. So this all is very important. And I want to preface this by saying you can always make things as complicated as you want to. But when you're trying to determine truth, in whatever it is in life, you have to try to not make it complicated. I know that sounds easy, uh, and it's easy for me because I've been doing this long enough. But for the audience, it's very important. So she moved out February 1st. That's, that's important, okay? When you look at victim all, she's a fun loving girl. Everybody loves her. Uh, the life of a party. When I'm reading up on her and researching her and listen to her best friends talk about her, I am getting vibes of Lacey Peterson. 
And not only because of this crime scene, um, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but just her statue, uh, five foot one, you know, a buck something, not very big, tiny girl, much like Lacey Peterson was, living near a bay, and and more things than just that that are not that strike me of Scott Peterson and Lacey Peterson. Um, so very fun loving. She had got battled breast cancer. I read a very um, witty and funny letter, I guess, that she had wrote during that time um, to her breasts, you know, saying that she had to get rid of them and stuff. It was very cute, very witty. Uh, it showed me a little bit of her personality because it's very hard to sit here and be judgmental against somebody by reading things on paper. Uh, you really have to dive into them without when you don't know them. And that's why it's important to go out and talk to her friends and people that really know the victim. Now, she, like I said, she had an affair with her gym instructor. She was getting back into shape, it appears, because of she had gained some weight through the chemotherapy and radiation, and she had an affair. Does that make her a bad person? Listen, I'm not the morality police, but I will say that affairs are a cause, a major cause, of homicides. On one side or the other. Now, she's a little bit older. She's 51. You know, this girl who, she's been around the block, meaning she's she's educated in the ways of life. It ain't like she's a 21-year-old going to the gym, been married for two years, and she cheats on a guy or her husband with this guy from the gym. No, it doesn't seem like it's like that. She's 51. So she's older. That plays into things too, her, her train of thought. Um, but what I would like to do is jump forward to her timeline. Because it is key to this case. And March 1st, this is in, again, in Maryland, next to the water. It's a chilly night. I believe the temperature there was 37 degrees with 15 mile an hour winds. She is separated, as I stated, from her husband. She's living in another house, a condo. She is out at a job interview. This is on a Friday night, March 1st. And she ends up going to get a few drinks. Now, I've come to learn this from her friend, Debbie, who we interviewed. Now, this, that's important to me, and it should be important to you. I, I need to know, and this is something that I don't know, was that in character or out of character for her? Um, from pictures that I've seen, it looked like that's the norm. They would go out, have fun. There's pictures I have of her and Wayne going out, having fun, having drinks, whatever it is. So, it seems like she's okay with her alcohol, but I don't know that for sure. And that's something that I would, I certainly would like to know. Um, when she drank, did she get, you know, so messed up that she couldn't walk? Uh, did she do this every night? Was it a once in a weekend thing? You know, things like that. But she went out and had drinks. It's a 30 minute roughly from Annapolis where she was at to Wayne's house. Now, why Wayne's house? Because at some point at the night around 10, 1030, she has conversations with her husband, Wayne. And now we don't know what those conversations are, right? But through phone records, we can determine it happened. Well, as you know from the 911 call, she made it there, 
okay? Wayne calls and says, hey, her, her car's here, um, but she's, her and the dog are gone. Well, why is that important? It's important because when he's interviewed later by police, his story bothers me. They said, did you talk to Robin at all? You know, we have the phone records show. Yeah, I talked to her. What were you talking about? She was going to come over and pick up some mail, pick up some clothing, things like that. Okay, then what happened? I went to sleep. Well, that's, that's a red flag for me. You're saying you have your ex-wife, well, it's current wife. You guys have been separated since December, but she moved out in February. So it's only been a, a month one month to the day it appears and you're just going to go to sleep and she's coming over that doesn't make sense to me this is at 10 30 at night he goes on to explain that he woke up about an hour later so now we're looking at 11 30 he goes out side and sees her car he goes up knocks on the window she's in there sleeping now this is either one of two things it's the absolute truth, and we can back that up by evidence of her drinking, okay? Or it's a complete and utter fabrication. And which one is it? Well, I will get to that when we start deducing some possibilities to probabilities. Um... Wayne says after he taps on there and she's sleeping, he wakes her up and he says, hey, go in and get your stuff, whatever you got to do. I'm leaving because he says he decides to leave. His attorney advised him, hey, you shouldn't be around her. She's coming to get things around the house. Just, just leave. So he decides to do that. He says that he goes to his house, his mom's house, his mom and dad's house. They, in subsequent interviews, state that they don't recall that. And then he stops at a 7-Eleven to get a cup of coffee. And he's seen on surveillance video there. Now, there's another red flag for me. Two reasons. And one of them could be easily explained away but why are you getting coffee think back to the last exit unsolved that we did with jolene witt and the uncle getting up making coffee at two in the morning four in the morning i guess it was why are you planning on staying up you just got two hours of sleep in the jolene witt case are you planning on staying up all day that doesn't make sense unless you know something took place um, or he could just said, hey, I'm up. I might as well stay up. I, there was somebody, maybe it broke in my house. I'm not going back to sleep. That's a good possibility for the uncle, yes. But it's still a red flag. Same thing here. You just said you were asleep. You got up to leave the house after seeing her in the car. And then you go to a convenience store to get coffee. Why are you getting coffee? You planning on staying up late? Um, I would want to know that about his background. Is he a coffee drinker? And if so, when? Like for me, I'm a coffee drinker, but I only drink it in the morning. I'm not drinking it at night unless I'm planning on staying up all night. So, it's a red flag. It's also, I'd like to know if, how often he visited that convenience store. And if he knew that they had cameras there that would capture him on camera. And I would be interested in his first interview with police if he brought up, well, hey, it, it wasn't me. You can see me on camera at the local 7-Eleven store, giving himself essentially an alibi. But if you committed a crime, you're never going to have an alibi. Okay, so he was seen on this surveillance camera at 115. 
No, I take that back. 107 a.m. At 115, he is now at Robin and his mutual friend, Debbie, who we did the interview with. And he's saying, hey, Robin and Bella, the great Dane dog that they have, are gone. I don't know where they're at. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think it was around 12, 31 o'clock when my daughter came home and came upstairs to tell me that Wayne was downstairs and he wanted to know if I had seen Robin. And so I got up immediately, came downstairs and found Wayne. Um, Wayne said that Robin had called and she wanted to come by the house to pick up her mail. Like, I can't describe, I mean, it was a Wayne that I've never seen before. He was very, um, he was very fresh. When I say that, he looked like he had just showered, but his face was real red. He was dressed all in black. And he just kept saying, I just, I don't know where she is. I, I can't, I, I left her there. My lawyer said we shouldn't be alone together. So I left to go to my dad's. When I came back, she was gone. Her and Bella are gone. Now Bella's this huge Great Dane. Um, her car was there, but she's nowhere to be found. So I stopped the timeline right there. Okay, because the more timeline you have, just more difficult it becomes. Well, why? We don't need that. 115, the timeline ends. 1030, the timeline begins. So between 1030, when we know she was on the phone with Wayne, and cell phone pings put her, I believe it was on Oregon Road, Whatever road it was, it was within two to three minutes from their address on, I believe it's Beach Road. So, this crime occurred between 10.30 p.m. and 1.07. We could have basically maybe stopped it there, but we'll go to 1.15 because we know that he was seen with Debbie saying that she was missing and that's when everything started so 10 30 to 1 15. if this is a murder that's when it occurred if it's an accident that's when it occurred if it's a suicide that's when it occurred if it was uh, a natural death and what and what do i mean by that what if she's walking along the shoreline and has a heart attack is it possible yes is it probable no so, remember, we, we have to start deducing that. I think we can roll, roll away natural, but let's continue on with the timeline. We stopped the timeline for if, when something happened. The next day, her Great Dane dog is found dead. Washed up under the rocks. Uh, I believe it was right next door. It was, it was close by, within a half a mile. They just had discovered Bella, who had washed up at the neighbor's house. So they found the dog that day? Yes, they found the dog that day. And um, the, the neighbor that found the dog went right to Wayne and knocked on the door and said, hey, your, your dog is you know, in my yard. And she said he never came out. He just said, oh, well, this isn't going to be good. My wife is missing as well. But he never came outside to get the dog. He just did, you know, just left, you know, she left. I guess she must have called somebody to come for the dog. He claims, so at some point he went, when they came to question him, Wayne has scratches and they're not scr they're big marks across his torso. And he claims that he got those when he went to pull Bella out of the water, but he never did. He never was, he had nothing to do with Bella coming out of the water or I guess the whoever they call to come pick up the dog. Dog is dead. They do an autopsy on the dog and they find that the dog died of hyperthermia. That's important. I keep saying that's important because I want you guys to remember this. 
search continues on for what 23 days until Robin's body is discovered her body is discovered in the bay right behind the house about less than a mile away by a fisherman who's fishing with his daughter she's been in the water for three weeks guys so what's that tell you she's decomposed and an autopsy while very important you have to do it is likely not to to give up any of its clues because of being in the water that long so again is this reminding you of anything is it not just like lady lacy peterson okay um so the autopsy is done and they can't determine death now they did say that she had water in her lungs initially i'm thinking that's important because that means she went into that that wa the the water breathing yet the lungs can absorb water depending on how long the body's been in there so you can't really say that 100 percent one of the clues that her body did provide was that she had high heel shoes on um, that clue is something else that we can start deducing so let's go back to okay how did she meet her demise was it an accident so let me give you a scenario an accidental death meaning maybe she's walking her dog and she's in high heels she trips and falls into the water and she's drunk and she can't get out possible certainly probable no we already talked walking has a medical issue brain an aneurysm heart attack she's out there by the water falls in possible yes probable no her taking her own life she's upset because of the pending divorce um and she decides to drown herself possible in some people's mind yes probable no okay so that leaves us with one manner of death left and what is that it's homicide unless now we could expand on the accidental death right there's scenarios that could happen such as Wayne throwing the dog into the water and through victimology we know her love for that dog her friends some of them said that she loved the dog more than her husband so she would jump in to save the dog if the dog couldn't swim now i've come to understand that great danes don't like to swim um so whether i can't give an expert opinion on the dog that part still bothers me a little bit um but an accident like that none nonetheless this could have been a, whole, a big accident but he still he he saw it happen he didn't do anything he to didn't help do her. anything to help her nothing and he wouldn't so that's who he is mm -hmm. so you think this that wayne could have been responsible responsible for getting the dog in the water watching robin go in after the dog or maybe he pushed her in himself mm -hmm. i mean is that a possibility I mean, it's possible that he pushed her in and and bella maybe bella was bella was not on the on the rocks when we were down there. I think we would have saw her. Yeah, you know, I mean, and Bella tried to just lay there and waited for Robin, but again, I, he threw Bella in, I bet you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I think, he threw Bella in. What else does that remind you of? A long time ago, I did a case on Natalie Wood. Christopher walking in the boat and 
in the scenario that she went overboard or was pushed overboard and left to drown. That is a possibility here. But I think, I think we can rule out accidental, even with those scenarios. Could Wayne... Now, I, I guess the day before this, Wayne and her were talking on the phone, and there was a telephone or television man at Robin's new condo installing something and he overheard a conversation between the two and Wayne said you can't come see Bella the dog because I put her to sleep I put her down and she started crying and the independent witness who has no reason to lie stated that Bella's this huge great Dane <laughs> so she couldn't take Bella there and so she left Bella at the house with Wayne. So she would go down and see Bella all the time. Well, Wayne called her the night before and said um, she wanted to come down and see Bella or something. And he said, oh, well, didn't anybody tell? I put Bella down. I had her put down today. And she went, she went off. She was, you know, crying. And he's like, oh, well, I didn't really do that. I just wanted to see if you really cared for Bella. I mean, you do have emotions after all, Robin. I mean, he played those kind of head games with her. So she, you know, that's why she wanted to go down, check on the dog, because she doesn't know if Wayne's lying or... That is an indicator as well to somebody that has narcissistic tendencies. I don't know enough about him, but when you take pleasure in eliciting a reaction in a loved one by hurting them, by the, the, the verbiage that comes out of your mouth, that is part narcissistic. Now, I have written down here that the threat to that dog is key. You have him making a statement about a dog, about her, her beloved dog, and apparently she couldn't have dogs in the condominium, and that's why if she didn't have him, if you guys are wondering. If she loved him so much, why didn't she have the dog with her? Well, that was the reason. The threat to that dog the day before, and then the dog ending up dead, is a red flag for me. Now, I can't tell you exactly what happened. I wasn't there. But I can say that she, it's my opinion that she was murdered. And there's a litany of reasons for that. One of them, obviously, is him saying he fell asleep and then had to wake her in a car. Now, if she was extremely intoxicated... I would say that's possible. But she went there for a reason. She didn't go there to go to sleep. Right? Now, he enticed her there, I believe, somehow. Whatever that was. Possibly something to do with that dog. I can't get that dog out of the scenario. You see how he interjected the dog the day before to elicit a response from her? So now he knows, hey, she's going to react to that dog. I could tell her, hey, I am going to cut my wrists tonight because we are breaking up. And she might be like, well, okay, I'll, I'll call somebody to come help you. That's not going to get her there. But that dog will. Okay? Another thing that will get estranged people back together for a night is sex. There's no doubt about that. Now, I don't know 
anything about that in regards to this relationship. But if I had to guess, I'm saying that we could rule that out. I don't know what her proclivity was to sex, especially with her ex-husband. Listen, people, but the older you get, you know, I, I tend to steer away from that theory. But as an unbiased investigator, you must look at that as a possibility. Could he have said, or she got drunk and text him and say, hey, you want to get together tonight, so-and-so, well, you know. Hey, you go where you're most comfortable, okay? And if they were comfortable, 22 years of marriage together. If I was the on-scene investigator, that's what I would want to know. What was your sex life like? How often? Now, her friends would probably know that answer. I do not. But I can say off of experience, not personal, but, well, maybe personal. But anyhow, people come together for that. Especially late at night. This was a Friday night. She was drinking. I don't know how many drinks she has. Her receipts from Buffalo Wild Wings, if that's where she was at, should show that. Um, so I, I just have a feeling that it wasn't that. I keep going back to that dog. Now, my original thought was I wonder if he is sadistic enough that he would kill the dog and throw it in the bay, you know, and then murder his wife. But that is ruled out once the dog washes up on shore the next day and it's died of hypothermia. That puts a, puts a crux in the case for me. So we have to establish how did that dog get in that water? Well, I would say that the most likely scenario is this. There's an argument that takes place when she gets there. Over what? Who knows? Maybe it's him belittling her. And he, remember, the autopsy can't show whether, how, she, how she died. Um, but more than likely, it's not a gunshot. Now, I don't know if he owns any guns, any weapons, but I think an autopsy would have showed that. There would have been a nick on a rib from a stab wound or a gunshot. Skull would have had something. But even if it's, if it's a blunt force trauma, fracture, I think you would have a fractured skull. You would see that. But what wouldn't you see? So two ways here. You're strangled or you're thrown in and drowned. I, I don't believe um, I don't believe it's the latter because she remember she had her high heels on. So to me it's the former. She was strangled. Strangle being strangled is is very tiresome. It is very personal. And sometimes it is not premeditated, meaning it's an act of rage. It's something that is said um, in the heat of the moment when people will get strangled. Now, sometimes they will look for a weapon of opportunity, right? I think of the Alan Greenberg case. You're, you grab something that's close. You don't bring a weapon. Now here, she is coming to a crime scene. She doesn't know. She's coming there for a reason. I think we figured that out. I don't, I don't think it was to get clothing or get, or get something. At 10.30 night, it just doesn't make sense. What gets her there that late is the threat of that dog. Could be as simple as, hey, come get this effing dog before I kill it. I'm tired of it. Or could be, hey, you need to come get this dog. Uh, I'm, I'm done with it. I don't, I don't want it here anymore. Um, 
if you don't come and get it, you know, I'm going to put it down like I told you yesterday. That would get her there that late at night. Okay? The dog's playing a, such a, a key role. Think back to the 911 call. Okay? Her and the dog are missing. She could just have the dog. I don't want to fight about the dog. Dog, dog, dog. Everywhere you look, the dog. So I believe that's how he got her there. I can see her coming there to pick up that dog. Not to play with the dog. Not to see the dog. He threatened that dog. He threatened her with that dog. And it got him there. Or got her there. She wasn't sleeping in the car. I, I have a hard time thinking that she made it inside. But she probably did. And... Something happened. That's why no neighbors heard anything. There's no gunshots because she wasn't. She would have been strangled. And then thrown into the bay. And why do you? Why would you throw her into that lake? Well, because you panic. You know, a smart person. You know, somebody that had planned this out would have thrown the body in the back of a vehicle and taken it far away. But he doesn't. She has her high heels on. Now, if she was to have fell in accidentally, or if he pushed her in, I mean, here, you have a look at the shoreline. It, and I know it was choppy and the winds were blowing and it was cold that day, but you're right there. No matter how deep it is, you're telling me you can't get up off of those rocks or out of the water onto those rocks and start screaming for help? And nobody heard anything? See, that, that doesn't make sense to me. Even the dog not being able to get out of the water doesn't make sense to me. Yet, if you think about it like this. Say he murders his wife inside a house. Inside that house. Strangles her throws her into the water, and the dog's running around like crazy. I think of the O.J. Simpson case, and their Akita, and how it started wailing and started barking. Uh, nobody's going to hear that if the dog's inside the house, right? But, what if he opens up the door and says, go, lets the dog go. So it makes his story that the dog ran away. And what does the dog do? follows the scent and jumps in and, and to be with the owner. Now, to me, it would make more sense with the dog scenario if he murders her outside, pushes her in, strangles her, pushes her in the bay, and the dog jumps in. That's the only way the dog part makes sense to me, is it's like trying to protect its owner. I guess it's possible. I mean, a Great Dane is a big dog. Now, sure, you still pick her up and throw her in. And maybe he did that. And maybe he did do that. Um, but the details of how it happened, I'm not confident about. You know, I can only give like scenarios but pretty confident saying that it wasn't natural it wasn't she took her own life and it wasn't an accident if it was an accident and she just fell in she slipped on the rocks like some people will say um and I, first of all i think she could get back up now if she hit her head and was unconscious sure i i buy that well, what would she be doing down on the rocks in 37 degree weather, 15 to 20 mile an hour winds? Um, why would she be down there in high heels, right? That, that doesn't make sense. And that's the thing with trying to find out what happened, especially in equivocal deaths, 
is if it doesn't make sense, get rid of it. So, you know, the only exception is that it was the OJ case when Johnny Cochran said, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Well, that's an exception. That's an outlier because uh, a few months earlier and less moisture in that glove, that glove did fit. I'll just say that. Yet, um, I digress. This has all the earmarks of a homicide. But it's not what you know. It's what you can prove. Okay? Look where they live. It looks... It's like it's, there's not a serial killer living around the corner there. They didn't even have any burglaries in that area, according to the sergeant. So, a random intruder committing this doesn't make sense. You have to look at who she had conflict with. Don't worry about the person she had an affair with. He had an alibi. So did the fiancé of that person. She had an alibi. But even if they didn't, I wouldn't even consider them. I'd consider them for a half a second. Because you're looking for conflict. Okay? Where is the conflict? Where is she at? Okay? She's at his house. The same person she has conflict with. You can't... It's right there. Everything's right there. Something happened right there. And then everything that jumps off after that, all the red flags... Well, where do they point? Right back into that house where the conflict is. So, yes, this is a mystery, but it's not. Because it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. The dog thing has me a little, yeah, I'd like to talk to a veterinarian because initially when I wa or watched and researched this, I was like, Listen, I, I see the shoreline. That dog could get up those rocks. Now, I know he was an older dog. And I, I know a dog can swim. A dog, every dog I've ever met can swim. So when they said, a Great Dane can't swim, I was like, that boggled my mind. But I know older dogs... And I know how loyal they are. I know how loyal my dogs are. And if I was in the water, maybe it wouldn't come in after me. I don't know that. I would like to think that. But it would certainly run and be barking and carrying on. And it would lay there by the shore and, uh, uh, forever until I came back to them. So... You know, I again, I originally thought that he killed that dog. And there's evidence that he did, in fact, at least on one occasion, hurt an animal. I watched a report where his stepdaughter said that her dog dug a, dug a hole in the yard and he filled it with water and held the dog's head in it. Again, to me, it's a bit of a red flag. Uh, so, that's what I see in the Robin Pope case. Not a mystery to me. The mystery is how. It's not why. There was conflict. Greed, sex, revenge. Which one is it? Um, I don't know about insurance policies or anything to that. Um, so I think you could probably get rid of greed. It's not sex. Um, I would put this one under the big R for revenge, meaning jealousy. I, you know, you make me so angry. You're leaving me. All this conflict. Um, maybe she said something that s set him off, but... He brought her there for a reason. And he brought her there, I believe, under the pretense of something about the dog. And that's why she got there. 
Maybe he got her there because that's the only way that he knew that she would come. And they could talk. Or maybe he wanted sex. And she's like, no. You told me something about the dog. And then, well, you give your personal trainer sex, but you won't give me. Oh, I'm out of here. No, you ain't going anywhere. Slams the door, and then it's, it's on. And then after it's done, it's regret. I didn't really mean to do that. I was so angry, but it happened, and now I got to cover up. What do I got to do? Okay, I got to get out of here. Got to clear my head. Stop and get coffee, and you know, because I'm going to be awake. I got to go to all these people's house, report her missing, look like I'm searching for her, and it's all cover up after the event happens. Let me go over my notes here. Thirty-seven degrees, fifteen mile an hour winds. Trooper said uh, drowned. That bothered me. I had that written down here. I watched a uh, news report, and the sergeant, the Maryland State Police, said that all we know is she drowned. I think he misspoke her. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he's letting let let out something that people don't know. What do you mean she drowned? But he said that. I wrote it down here in quotations. If she drowned, then she went in there alive. One way or another. Whether somebody's holding her head down or she's knocked unconscious and she breathes in water into the lungs. But he said drowned. So... That bothered me. The dog died of hypothermia. She's in high heels. Oh, her shirt was found in the bay. So she goes missing March 1st. She's found, what, 23 or 28 days later. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number there. Uh, but within that time frame, her shirt is discovered. Now, why is that? I don't believe that shirt comes off just through the three weeks that she's in the bay it's possible but i don't think that's probable i think uh, i would want to know whether she had more clothing at that house how does that shirt end up in the bay was that part of the struggle that took place and in the offender's mind he believes hey i gotta get rid of this and it is thrown in the bay. Remember, may, may or may not have had blood on it. Um, I think when they found it, it didn't. But that doesn't mean that he, in the offender's mind that he it's part of the struggle. Maybe it was stretched out or something. You know, during the struggle, she's trying to leave and he grabs a hold of her and she gets out of the shirt, you know, and he grabs her in the cleanup. Hey, this was on her. I got to get rid of it. Maybe. I don't like that scenario too much because just, I, uh, I guess, if you already dispose of her into the water, it only makes sense that her shirt goes in the water too because you wouldn't want to dispose the shirt down the road on land because then that would really set off red flags, right? So. Yeah. Something happened there. It was there. Uh, I, I can't get over that. Another red flag, and I think, again, like I spoke of the trooper maybe misspeaking when he said, well, she drowned. That's all we know. There was also a report that her phone, her purse, her makeup bag were on the driver's seat of her car when the friend Debbie went back and, and looked for her. I'm thinking she misspoke and it was on the passenger front seat passenger side. If it's on if that's correct and if it's on the driver's side, we have a big problem. Right? Who's gonna put their purse, their cell phone, their makeup bag on the front driver's seat where you're sitting? No no, no. If that's where it is, that was staged. No doubt about it. 
So I, I'm thinking that when she said uh, on the driver's seat, I think she probably meant up front passenger seat. Threat of dog. The keys, I was wondering where the keys were. Were the, the keys inside the ignition or somewhere else on the seat? Um, again, victimology would tell you, let's say you found the keys on the seat. Is that normal? When she went to the house, where would she, you know, to me, you'd just leave them in the ignition. Where they're at, there's no threat of somebody stealing your car. So if they were found somewhere else other than that, there would, there would be a, a problem. But Wayne not taking a polygraph. A lot of people have brought this up. Um, I mean, I don't blame him for it. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't believe in polygraphs. I've said that numerous times. I've seen them operate. I've taken them. Um, they, yes, they do work on some people, but they don't work on other people. I've seen people that were guilty pass them, and I've seen vice versa. So, to me, no. But post-test and pre-test questions, yes. I'm certainly interested, and we never got to that with him. But, but listen, police know. I'm not saying anything here, you know, that police don't know. They have their eyes on him for good reason. There's no random offender at 10.30 going to come in for that just one little hour, you know, while he's asleep and he tells her that he's leaving and they're going to do all these things to kill him. No. No. The only thing that I would entertain other than homicide, I would entertain accident. Depending upon her intoxication level. That's what it would all depend on. And I guess you would know that by knowing, talking to the bartender and seeing her receipts, so on and so forth, from where she was at at Buffalo Wild Wings. Because it is possible, if she was highly intoxicated, that she went out on those rocks for whatever reason, to get the dog, whatever it is. I know wearing high heels, it doesn't make sense, but... Listen, every stupid decision I've ever made in my life, I was under the influence of alcohol. That's why I don't drink anymore. Well, that's one of the reasons. But, is it, it's possible. I'm not saying that that is probable. Okay? But, it's a possibility. And the only way that that scenario makes sense to me is if she fell in and hit her head and went unconscious. And then the dog goes in after her. Yes. Possible. But it's more probable that there's a conflict taking place. And it's, it's verified. There's a verified conflict that takes place between two individuals there. And then that person ends up missing and then ultimately dead. You have to to look at that other person. So if I had to say, I would say it's more probable than not that the spouse, the estranged spouse, Wayne, is responsible for his wife's demise. I would say that it is possible that she died of an accident. If she fell in the water or went in the water. See, that's a scenario I, I don't buy. Is that Wayne threw the dog in. And then she went in after the dog. And then drowned. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. Because the first thing she would do, I believe, is kick off those high heel shoes. Maybe not when she jumped in. If she jumped in out of panic. To get the dog. Um, but while she's treading water. She would take off. You know those high heels. You would just click them off with your feet. You know the sole or the heel of your foot. Uh, and she. And she could swim. It's not like she couldn't swim. 
So she could get to the rocks easy. It's not like she's 50 feet from shore. She's right there. I, so I don't buy that. I think she was put in that water after she was already deceased. That's what statistics tell me, and that's what I'm going with. That's what I think. So that's it. I am going to link the, or not link, I'm just going to put the full interview. You saw snippets of it, but I'm going to put the full interview of Debbie, the uh, friend at uh, our team, Andrea. She was so gracious enough to uh, interview and get some great insights on victimology especially. And again, I think what's very important is that when you listen to Debbie, listen, the people that are there in that circle of friends, they know. Debbie saw him a couple hours after this. She described him as flustered. You can listen to her and you'll hear what she has to say, but those are the people that, that need to be listened to. Not people like me or other people that are looking into the case from the outside and we give our opinions. Yeah, okay, listen. But who you should really be listening to is the people that know those people. And if Debbie, who's been her friend for two decades, says, hey, something isn't right with him, well, who do you think you ought to be listening to? Think of the Chris Watts case and that neighbor who's caught on body cam. Hey, he's not acting right. Something's wrong. Well, yeah, he ain't acting right because he just murdered his whole family. Why do you think she said at 1 o'clock in the morning when Wayne came to her house and said, I can't find Robin or Bella anywhere, as soon as she, he leaves, she shuts the door and she looks at her daughter and says... He did something. She knows. Okay, she's been around him. She knows. Those are the people you have to listen to. I always say that. The people that were there on scene at the time is the people that you need to really listen to because that's where you get the feel of the case. You know, it's easy for me to Monday morning quarterback all these cases. Hey, Unfortunately or fortunately, that's what I do. You know, that's the job of a cold case investigator. That's what I've been doing for decades. Um, and sometimes it's not easy because I do not like to second guess investigators because I wasn't there. You know, these investigators that seen the dead body being pulled out of the bay or go into a bedroom and see the, the de decapitated girl or whatever it is, they're there. They have that visual. Step forward 20-something years and there I am looking at words or looking at pictures. No. That don't cut it. You want to talk to the people that were there. And the people that know the victim and the suspects the closest, they'll tell you. That's where you got to look. And that's where we looked when we talked to Debbie. She knows. Okay? Talk to the friends. Talk to Friends are more, almost more important than family. Why? Because I guarantee Robin had told more to her friends about her proclivities, her likes, her secrets than she would ever tell her mom and dad or brothers and sisters or daughters. Okay? There's certain things that you don't tell them, but they'll tell their friends. Think about yourself. There's things you won't tell your kids or your parents, but you'll tell your best friend when you're out having drinks. So, listen, the goal of this is to get the word out. And maybe I saw something that investigators were like, ooh, okay. You know, maybe a scenario, something. It's important for these victims' families and friends. Because there's nothing worse than not knowing. And at least in this case, she's not missing anymore. But that's only half of the mystery being solved. Now there's more. But it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. 
There are thousands of murderers walking free amongst us. They're standing in line at the grocery store right in front of you, and you would never know. It's not what you know. It's what you can prove. I'm going to end this episode of Exit Unsolved with that. To the family and friends of Robin, I would just say never give up. Hold strong, just like she was when she went through that cancer treatment. Okay? There will eventually be a crack in the case, a crack in the armor, and it will happen. You've got to have faith. With that said, Mains out. Me, the the details of what happened to Robin, like the time, like what year was it? You know, what what where we are when this all happened? The the night or leading up to it? Or um, let's just go for the night. Like what when? So what night it was, was this? March first. 2013 and I spoke with her that day that morning on my way to work because we spoke we, we talk every every morning and every evening on our way home from work um, and she was off that Friday she was Wayne and she were separated and she lived in a condo up the road um, and she was home that day gonna wait for telephone man was coming to put in a new line and that was the last I heard from her. I had texted her, Robin and I, when some, some of the things we did together, we had a death pool. <laughs> so whoever got per, a famous person that died first, you know. So somebody died that day. Lady from, I don't even remember her name, but I did text it, I have that in there, saying I got this person. And she just, re I don't even think she responded to that. So that was one thing. Um, when I left work, I called her, didn't, get a call back until about six o'clock she texted me and said that she was at a job interview and that she would text me in a little while and I just told her that we were up at this place called ours and that was the last I heard from her um, until I think it was around 12 31 o'clock when my daughter came home and came upstairs to tell me that Wayne was downstairs and he wanted to know if I had seen Robin and so I got up immediately, came downstairs and found Wayne. Um, Wayne said that Robin had called and she wanted to come by the house to pick up her mail and pick up a fence, fence hole poker or whatever. Robin had also had a fence business on the side, um, as did Wayne, but a separate company. And she was doing a job that weekend and needed the fence hole poker or whatever it is. I don't even know what the thing was called. Um, thank you. <laughs> Not good at this. Um, and he, he was like, I can't describe, I mean, it was a Wayne that I've never seen before. He was very, um, he was very fresh. When I say that, he looked like he had just showered, but his face was real red. He was dressed all in black and he just kept saying, I just, I don't know where she is. I, I can't, I, I left her there. My lawyer said we shouldn't be alone together. So I left to go to my dad's. When I came back, she was gone. Her and Bella are gone. Now Bella's this huge Great Dane. Um, her car was there, but she's nowhere to be found. So I, I tried to call her. We instantly went to voicemail um, and I just, he asked if we had a key, my daughter, that where she was living was my daughter's condo. So he asked, did we have a key to the condo that he wanted to go check to see if she was there? So Jennifer and Wayne went up to the condo and I waited here. Yeah. So they left to go to the condo and I got a couple of text messages from Rachel, Wayne and Robin's daughter, just asking, have you seen my mom? My dad said she's missing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you'll, I mean, you'll be able to see the messages because I can't remember right offhand, but mm -hmm. Rachel does say, do you think my dad did something to her? Which, you know, 
automatically makes you think something. Um, anyways, they left, they came back, you know, of course, Robin wasn't at the condo. Um, and Wayne said, I don't know what to do. And I said, go home, go home and call the police, Wayne. So I closed the door. I looked at my daughter. I said, you know, we did something to her. And she was like, no, 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 no. He's, he's really, he's really worried, mom. Sorry. So he went home, he called the police. And then at about 4 a.m., they called me just to, you know, I guess, verify the story that he had come here looking for Robin. Um, and then around, I don't know, eight or nine o'clock in the morning, I went, we went down to his house. And that's when he had told me, you know, he's been calling everybody. He called Kathy and then I think Kathy texted him as we were there and he said, oh, that's Kathy. And I said, oh, well, Robin and I were supposed to have dinner with her on Monday night. And he said, I hope that happens. So, yeah. So, uh, again, he was, he wouldn't let us, he didn't want us to come in the house. I went down there with my daughter and two other friends of ours. Um, he didn't want us to come in the house. He was just kind of shady. He was just, he, he looked concerned. So he looked like something happened. Um, but her car was there and her phone was there and her purse was there and her met, she, like I said, she had breast cancer. Um, her meds for, um, after chemo and all that were there. Um, everything was in her car. And he had me, you know, one of the things that flagged for me was he had me call her when he was up here, but he knew all that stuff was in the car. Um, the police came here that morning. What did they say to you? They got here around 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I guess, after I came back. And they just wanted to, you know, find out, you know, again, they asked all the questions that they asked me on the phone. It was two sheriffs and some lady was with them. And they said, I'm, I just lost it with them. I just said, listen, Wayne is a very good friend of mine, but uh, he did something to her. I said, he did something to her. You need to go down there. He did something to her. And they were like, well, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to look? And my husband said, you might want to start with the bay. So that was, cause I don't know why we thought that, but we did. Um, maybe because of what he would say. Um, I took them, they asked if, you know, they could go to the condo and I took them to the condo and they went all through that. And it wasn't until maybe about 11, 12 o'clock when Rachel called me and said, they just had discovered Bella who had washed up at the neighbor's house. So they found the dog that day. Yes, they found the dog that day. And um, the, the neighbor, that found the dog went right to Wayne and knocked on the door and said, Hey, your, your dog is, you know, in my yard. And she said, he never came out. He just said, Oh, well, this isn't going to be good. My wife is missing as well, but he never came outside to get the dog. He just did, you know, just left, you know, she left, I guess she must've called somebody to come for the dog. He claims. So at some point he went, when they came to question him, Wayne has scratches and they're not scr they're big marks across his torso. And he claims that he got those when he went to pull Bella out of the water, but he never did. He never was, he had nothing to do with Bella coming out of the water or I guess the, whoever they call to come pick up the dog he did that part. Um, he just has all these different, flags in his story that mm -hmm. uh Bella's this huge great dane <laughs> so she d couldn't take Bella there and so she left Bella at the house with Wayne so she would go down and see Bella all the time well Wayne called her the night before and said um she wanted to come down to see Bella or something and he said oh well didn't anybody tell I put Bella down I had her put down today and she went, she went off. She was, you know, crying and he's like, oh, well, I didn't really do that. I just wanted to see if you really cared for Bella. I mean, you do have emotions after all, Robin. 
I mean, he, he played those kind of head games with her. So she, you know, that's why she wanted to go down, check on the dog, because she doesn't know if Wayne's lying or, you know. She, when I tell you the phone man was there that morning to put in the phone, he would, he heard the conversation between Robin and Wayne and the mm -hmm. dog. Mm -hmm. Like he spoke with the police because there's other things he heard and he wouldn't, I don't know, he won't talk to anybody but them. He never talked to anybody else. Right. Um, so the dog washes up on the shore. The neighbors tell Wayne, your dog's here. He right. doesn't come out. Doesn't come do out. anything. Doesn't do anything. Claims he did, though, because of the scratches. And she's the one. Her name's Elaine. You know Elaine? Oh, I know Elaine. You know Elaine. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Elaine said no. Wayne never came out to the dog. Never. So what ended up happening with the dog? So they had, I, whoever they called, because they did an autopsy. Oh, animal control. Yeah, maybe mm -hmm. it was animal control. Mm -hmm. They called the police too. I think the police were down there. Okay. I think that's when that's when they put Robin into the, you know, the missing. Like if she wasn't even put into the what do, what do they call that? The like the missing persons yeah. database. The missing persons database, and that's when everybody started calling because mm -hmm. you know it was Robin. Um, but he was gone then for a couple days because, so this was on a Saturday. He was gone until Sunday night, I think, because he was at the police station. They picked him up. They went and picked him up and questioned him for all night or whatever. Um, so he called me. I didn't talk to him again until Monday. When, and that's when he called me at work to tell me that, we had had a conversation the week prior. He had called me and said um, that he had gone to, so Robin had an, the problem between Wayne and Robin, Robin had an affair. Doesn't make her a bad person though. But um, not, I mean, it's not a reason for her to die. Um, she had an affair, he found out about it, and he went to the guy's house and he said he had gone there to see Rob, his name was Rob, and when he knocked on the door, Rob's fiance, Rachel, answered the door. And then I guess Rob was upstairs, you know, wouldn't come down the stairs because it was Wayne. And Wayne said it was a good thing that Rob didn't come downstairs because he had a gun in his pocket. And I was like, well, Wayne, that's, that's stupid. You know, why mm -hmm. would you want to go to jail over this? That's stupid. So he had called me that Monday to tell me that we never had that conversation. I said, but we did. And he said, no, no, um, we, we've, I never told you that. And I said, but you did. And you told Priscilla the same conversation, which he did. And he, he said, everybody's against, you know, you want, everybody's against Wayne. Wayne, nobody was against Wayne. We would have, I would have stood behind Wayne 100%, but Wayne never helped us. Wayne never went out and searched with us. Never, I mean, Robin disappeared and so did Wayne. He never, never helped us. So we had people putting these signs, you know, these signs all over the place. He said he couldn't, his lawyer advised him not to. But again, if my husband, if my husband was missing and I didn't have anything to do with it, I don't, you know, I don't care what my lawyer would say. I'd still be out there looking yeah. for him, um, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't help us. Um, what do we know happened that night? What are the facts of the case that that has been reported that they know happened that night? We know that Wayne and Robin were texting back and forth from Annapolis. We know that Robin was in Annapolis. We know she went on this job interview at GNC. We know that she went for drinks with some friends. She went to, we know that she went to Buffalo Wild Wings because somebody, a neighbor behind me worked at Budget Blinds and saw her walking in there. Um, next day blinds. Next day blinds, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> um, so we know that she was out with friends having, having drinks. Bartenders that also attested that they served her. Yes. Well, they have receipts too from the places mm -hmm. that she went. 
Uh, we know that Wayne and Robin were conversing back and forth via text. Um, she wanted to come get her mail. Um, we know that she showed up there and Wayne claims that he fell asleep while she was on her way there. She was like two minutes from the house where he claims he fell asleep. So he says he fell asleep when he woke up, he went outside and Robin was there and that he told her he was leaving and that she could go get her mail and go see Bella or whatever. And that when he returned, she was gone. So he claims he left Robin there. Yes. And the dog was there. Right. And he leaves the property because he was advised not to be there at the same time. Right. Okay. So then he says, um, when he returned, he, he claims he left. He claims he went to his parents' house in um, Prospect Bay and picked up the pickup truck because he had a job that weekend too. He brings, he comes back home. He, well, on his way, he stops at 7-Eleven where he's seen on camera and that's why he stopped at 7-Eleven. Um, and then he goes back to the house and Robin's gone. Then he leaves and comes up here. To your house? Yeah. Okay. What do you think happened that night? So I think, and this is just my opinion. Mm -hmm. okay. I think that Robin, oh, you know, Robin went down there. She's not, you know, she wants to see her dog. Um, but I think Wayne used the dog to get Robin down there. Um, and I think when she got there, something, I think they had a fight. And I think, I, I almost think that Wayne was out on the pier holding the dog and threw the dog in the water. And do I think Robin would jump in the water to save her dog? Yeah. And I think Wayne walked away. So he, you think he did something to the dog first? Yes. That's and that's how the dog ended up in the water mm -hmm. and she went in to get to help the dog to mm -hmm. the shore. Okay. Your theory is the dog, the Wayne dog has is, the dog mm -hmm. under his control. Mm -hmm. She's freaking out because he has the dog. He pushes the dog in the water. How deep was, like, how deep is that water out there? I mean, because the dog could swim, used, right? Or no? He used to say, Bella. He used to drop, he used to fish off that pier. Yeah. He said he would catch. 30 or 40 inch rockfish just by dropping a worm off the pier. So deep. this night was, it was very, very windy, like very windy. And what was the, the date again? Um, March 1st, 2013. Okay. Very windy and very choppy. Mm -hmm. So, and Robin was wearing heels. When she was pulled from the water, she had heels on still. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, this could have been a, whole, a big accident, but he still, he, he saw it happen. And he, he didn't do left, anything he to help her. He didn't do anything to help her. Nothing. And he wouldn't. So that's who he is. Mm -hmm. So you think this that Wayne could have been responsible responsible for getting the dog in the water, watching Robin go in after the dog, or maybe he pushed her in himself? Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a possibility? I mean, it's possible that he pushed her in, and, and Bella, maybe Bella was, Bella was not on the on the rocks when we were down there. I think we would have saw her. You know, I mean, and Bella tried to just lay there and waited for Robin, but again, I, he threw Bella in, I bet you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I think. He threw Bella in and Robin, probably Robin too, but yeah, I believe Robin would jump in the water. I mean, one of somebody, one of the, the oceanographer or whatever said, you know, somebody said Robin was a, a, a great swimmer. Robin could swim. She didn't, you know, but that water that night. You can't swim in heels and clothes heels and, and clothes it's cold. And it's freezing cold. The water, you know, the temperature of the water. There were ice caps on the Yeah. Day. And there was ice on the pier oh, that next yeah. morning, too. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, she could have slept. Yeah. Wayne was there. Wayne was there for this whole, you know, mm -hmm. Wayne knows what happened to Robin. Mm -hmm. He does. Okay, so she goes missing. Um, the police are at your house. The police are questioning Wayne. She's Robin is now considered a missing person. Yes. Okay, and then so for how long was she missing before she was found? And tell me how she was found. She was missing for 23 days. 
Um, we searched for 23 days. We found her shirt in the water near their house. Um, and then she was, okay, 23 days. She was found on, I think it's like five or six houses down from their home. Um, a man was out fishing on his pier and looked down and there she was. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And they, mm -hmm. Do you remember what Wayne's reaction was when they found Robin? No, because I had talked to, I talked to Wayne the night before. I called him because somebody, there was, somebody had said Wayne jumped off the Bay Bridge, which Wayne would never do. <laughs> he would not, you know. So anyways, I called him to see if he was okay, and he was. And um, he said, um, I, I've got some information that I'll share with you tomorrow. And I said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll give you a call tomorrow. I said, okay. And I never heard from him because the problem was found. And I don't, I don't, I never really talked to him again. I saw him when I went to the funeral home to help plan everything they did. He was there, I sat across the table from him. But other than that, mm -hmm. I saw him at the funeral. What did the autopsy say? Do you recall? I, I don't. I'm not. I, there was no um, definitive reason or cause for her death. It wasn't drowning. It wasn't. I don't think it says drowning. No, it doesn't. Because she was do she was too decomposed. Could they not have? Did they not have a reason for her death? They couldn't say. You know, they couldn't, she had, you know, her head would, you know, you couldn't, they really couldn't because she had been in the water for 23 days. Mm -hmm. They couldn't say if, you know, there was blunt force to the head from an object or the, the rocks that her head was, were up against, or they couldn't say if she drowned. There was water in the lungs, but, you know, Again, yeah. What about the dog? Did they have an autopsy done? There was an that? autopsy of the dog. Didn't she have hypothermia? Is that the diagnosis? But she had water in the lungs she too. Did. But yeah, I. You know what? We can find out. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can get the report. Just to see what. Yeah. Goes. Where does the dog was at Chesapeake, uh, Chesapeake Veterinarian? Where does this case stand today? It's been 10 years, right? Over 10 years now. So it's a cold case. They still, it's still open for investigation. They're, you know, the, I know the lead investigator retired. Mm -hmm. So there's a new investigator. And I did send him some information that came from Wayne's sister. Nadine. Nadine. What um, kind of information was that? Um, well, she had given me information that her son, Jimmy, so there was a boat that went out the morning prior to that early morning for the, when Robin disappeared. A boat that hadn't been touched in months. Yeah. Years. Years. It was at Wayne's father's house. Years. And they also, I don't know. Anyways, they said they they went out oystering that morning. Um, Nadine's son Jimmy and his friend. Nadine says Jimmy saw a hammer with blood on it in the garage of Wayne's father, Wayne Senior's house. And then, you know, maybe an hour later when he went back in there, the hammer was gone. But he and his friend said they saw it. Now. Nadine told me that, and Priscilla questioned Jimmy. And Jimmy said, no, but Nadine said, yes, it's true. Um, and who's Nadine? Nadine is Wayne's sister. Sister, okay. Right. Move the thin ghost of music in the spinet. I cannot say your speed, I cannot wander your hill land. Or your cornlands or your valleys ever again Nor share the battle yonder Where the young knights of broken squadron rallies
only sit quiet while my mind remembers the beauty of fire from the beauty of embers. <laughs>